As the population ages, we find ourselves really operating on patients that are older and older. Uh, it is not that uncommon, as most of you know, to be operating on people in their 80s now, certainly 70s, occasionally even the people in their 90s, which 10, 15 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, would have been unthinkable. Um, what, and part of that is attributable to the fact that people are living longer, they're healthier longer, our surgical techniques have gotten better, anesthesia techniques have gotten better, perioperative care has gotten better. There are a lot of things to credit with the fact that we're able to safely operate on people that are older. But one thing I find myself thinking about much more is osteoporosis. We encounter it way more. I check it way more often, even in males now. Uh, and it's not unusual to find people with poor bone density perioperatively. So the question is what to really do if you have to operate on somebody with osteoporosis, like what tools do you have in your shed? Um, clearly, if you can get people six months of some type of um, uh, anabolic treatment so that you can get their bone density stronger, that would be awesome. But if you find yourself operating on a trauma or somebody who doesn't have great bone density and really non-surgical treatment and optimization isn't an option, then really what can you do? And that's really what I'd like to cover now. I, I think of it in a few different categories. You can think about it in instrumentation. What can you do with your instrumentation? And when I was a fellow, uh, now 15 years ago, uh, the rule was go big or go home in osteoporosis, like more points of fixation, that was what you had available. But I think now we do have other things we can do. There's greater understanding that pedicle fill, like really getting the biggest pedicle screw you can get into the pedicle to engage more of that denser cortical bone or even the cancellous bone that's adjacent to it, using bigger pedicle screws um, is a very important technique. And often if somebody is osteoporotic, I will consider using NAB just to be sure I've gotten the biggest screw I can into that level. Using different trajectory pedicle screws. So I, I like cortical trajectory pedicle screws because they capture the densest part of the, of the vertebral body and the pedicle itself. The entry site is dense cortical bone. The exit site is dense cortical bone. And I find that to be a very effective technique uh, in people with osteoporosis. Using non-coplanar screws, and this is a bit of an advanced principle, but if you put a bunch of screws in and they all kind of line up and they're all effectively parallel or what we'd call coplanar, they don't necessarily have any more than, if you put three screws in, it has three times the pullout strength. But if you have screws that are non-coplanar, the more non-coplanar they can be, the better the pullout strength as well. So I think using different trajectory pedicle screws and also making your screws non-coplanar, like that is all like fairly valuable in terms of osteoporosis. You can use cement augmentation, that's an easy thing. I usually do it with fenestrated pedicle screws. So I put the screws in, make sure I like the position and then infiltrate cement, which will harden in vivo. And really almost creates like this dense, you know, it looks like a cotton ball on fluoro, but it's hard. And so it helps engage the cancellous bone around it. Um, so cement augmentation, I think, can be a very valuable tool as well. And those are all things that you can do just with the instrumentation. Of course, you can go more levels as well if you need to. Then there's supplements we have now. Like you can use hooks and wires like they did 50 years ago. Uh, now, mersaline tape is very nice, and I'll use mersaline tape either around the spinous processes or sometimes uh, around the lamina to kind of engage bone, to kind of supplement the pedicle screw fixation itself, and that's a useful tool now. It's been around a long time, but the modern interpretation of that is really with, you know, mersaline tape or other types of straps. And then lastly, I think that you can really think about what type of inner body spacer you're going to use. Uh, and in an osteoporotic person where I want to do something with their alignment, I'd be more inclined to use uh, an inner body spacer with a broad footprint. Uh, and what that means is the broad cross-sectional area. So you're spreading the axial load over a bigger footprint. It's a bit like a snowshoe phenomenon where if you walk outside in, in, in the snow with a small footprint shoe, it's going to you know, dive right in. But if you use a snowshoe, you're spreading the same load over a broader footprint. So an A-lift or a lateral, those spacers are much better than a, than a T-lift or a plif cage might be. Uh, for the risk of subsidence. Now, I also may go the other direction and say, look, their alignment is pretty well preserved. I'm not gonna distract it open and create some gap. If somebody's very collapsed, I might just keep them there. Obviously that has alignment consequences as well, but being thoughtful about whether you're gonna put a cage in and what type of cage you're gonna use, and even the material of the cage I think is important as well. So those are the tools that I think we have available to us when managing people with osteoporosis. It's a much richer arsenal than we had 20 years ago, but I hope that you figure out in your specific patients with osteoporosis, which of these make, make the most sense.